Okay, let's begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalie Bubaker, and I am the Director of Special Projects at Canopy, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar. Canopy is an urban forestry nonprofit that plants and cares for trees throughout the Mid-Peninsula, and we offer, offer webinars like this one to provide guidance from Bay Area experts on ways to grow and preserve our urban forests um, by offering useful tools and information to decision makers like you. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. For technical support, send a message in the chat to, and my colleague, uh, Michael Horgis will help you out. So we're gonna reserve the chat for tech questions. Um, if you have questions for our speakers, you can add them to the Q&A box. Um, just click on the Q&A box and you can add it there. We will be moderating the questions today by um, typing some responses to any uh, questions we can answer during the presentations, though many we will ask uh, our speakers during the Q&A um, time at the end of the presentations. Uh, some questions we may not have time to answer today, so we will um, compile the unanswered questions uh, with responses as best as we can and add them to the Canopy website uh, as soon as possible after the webinar. And just a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and uh, it will be uploaded to Canopy's website along with the presentation slides, and other relevant resources uh, following the webinar later this afternoon, evening. Um, and also following the webinar, we will have a uh, survey that we're hoping everyone can fill out. It will be helpful for us to hear your feedback. And relatedly, if you are an ISA certified arborist and are participating in this live webinar, um, please fill out the survey and with your information and we will submit it to West Coast ISA for one and a half CEUs. Uh, you can also grab the CEU, CEU code uh, upon submitting the survey at the end as well, if you wanna do it yourself. With that, I'll introduce our speakers. So today we have Dr. Erica Spotswood, who is the Director of Science and Senior Ecologist at Second Nature. She is an uh, urban ecologist who emphasizes the importance of reintegrating California's native oaks and other species into our urban canopies. Dave Muffley is the senior, uh, this is the former senior arborist at Apple where he planted 9,000 trees within the Apple Park headquarters. He has also planted thousands of trees on the Stanford campus, uh, as well as along the 101 sound wall in East Palo Alto, and will offer insight into what he's observed over the years. And then we have Dr. Dave Fugino, who is the director of the California Center for Urban Horticulture at UC Davis. And he will share tools for watering trees efficiently and adapting our watering practices during extreme weather conditions caused by climate change. So with that, without further ado, I will let Dr. Erica Spotswood take it away. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Can you confirm you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Hello everyone and thank you for being here. Um, I'm Erica Spotswood and I work for uh, Second Nature Ecology and Design, which is a small consulting firm just founded about a year ago that focuses on um, using science to integrate nature um, back into our cities in a way that benefits people, both people and nature and biodiversity. So um, this, uh, so our firm is small, and as I said, just just started a year ago, and um, several of us came from um, San Francisco Estuary Institute, where we worked together previously for 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 quite a few years. And so some of the work that I'll be talking about here was actually conducted and led by myself and Robin Grossinger while we were at SFEI. So when we think about urban trees and the potential impacts of, of climate change on urban trees, we can sort of start with what we know about uh, the impacts of climate change in California more broadly. So we know that uh, climate change is 
um, going to increase is already increasing temperatures and will increase the frequency and severity of extreme heat events and will also likely increase the frequency and duration of drought events going forward. And so we can take that information and think about what how that might likely impact urban trees. You know that urban trees live in uh, a matrix of impervious cover and, and, and um, elevated temperatures already because of the urban heat island effect. And urban impervious cover reduces water infiltration and the availability of water to roots. And warming can induce drought stress by increasing atmospheric demand for water. And plant stress can increase urban herbivore fitness and reduce tree defenses. And in, stud, in, in cities, several studies have shown a relationship between impervious cover and herbivore damage of trees, or between drought, impervious cover, and herbivore abundance. So to give you one example, from a study uh, conducted in the southeastern U.S. of a, a sap-feeding insect on, um, on red maple, the study manipulated drought stress across an existing mosaic of urban warming. And they, what they found was an additive effect of temperature and drought stress. So female embryo production and body size increased with temperature, and that effect was greater on drought stress compared to water trees. And so when we think about urban trees, um, how to how to cope with climate change in, in, in uh, managing our urban forests. There's been quite a lot of focus on um, the question of species selection. So which species of tree may be most appropriate to plant given climate change. Um, but there's been, um, I'd argue a little bit less attention on how we protect our existing urban forest and um, our existing, uh, existing forest is pretty vulnerable to climate change. So I'll focus um, a, much of this talk on sort of what are the implications of climate change for the existing forest and what does that mean for, for, for what we might do to protect it. So we know that urban trees are important. So they're important both for the biodiversity benefits they provide and also for people. So there's many ecosystem services, as I'm sure many of you know, associated with trees in, uh, in urban landscapes. But thinking specifically about the health benefits of trees, we conducted a study just recently, um, <clears throat> a sort of large, uh, a, a large um, review paper on um, on the impacts of uh, nature more broadly on uh, on human health. And what we based this on was um, so a report that we had uh, that we wrote at SFEI, where we synthesized the global research on biodiversity in cities. We identified seven elements that work together to maximize biodiversity in urban landscapes. And these include um, the size of patches of habitat in, in parks and other types of open space, um, connections and corridors, and the quality of the urban matrix, among, among other things. And trees fall into that third, cat, uh, that third element of, of matrix quality. So we took that, um, that seven element framework and we asked, well, do those seven elements specifically, are they associated with health benefits as well. So the literature connecting human health to nature access and um, living adjacent and close to in contact with nature is really, really broad and crosses from uh, environmental psychology to medicine, public health, and epidemiology. And so what we did was we took this huge volume of literature and synthesized it with a specific focus on these seven elements to ask if you, um, if you, conduct interventions focused on building biodiversity in cities, will that also bring along human health benefits as well? And what we found uh, from the figure on the right is a diagram showing all the different connections between human health and these seven elements that support biodiversity in cities. And we found the connections are, are many and that many of these elements support multiple different types of human health benefits. But thinking specifically about extracting those results specific to trees, what we found for trees in particular is that um, trees reduce heat, can reduce heat, air, noise pollution, and, and um, UV radiation. They're also associated with improved mental health outcomes, including depression, anxiety, mood, stress, and attention restoration. They're associated with living close to trees. Um, or higher in an area with higher tree canopy cover is associated with more physical activity and improved weight status, improved cardiovascular function, improved immune function, and greater social cohesion as measured through connected as feeling of connectedness, belonging, and trust in your community, pro-social activities, and social capital. 
We also looked at the potential trade-offs between building, um, using urban greening to specifically benefit biodiversity and um, and human health. And what we found is that there are potential trade-offs. So if you if you conduct urban greening and and plant trees, some of the the negative outcomes that can come along with that are green gentrification, the production of allergens, pollen, and BVOCs or um, biogenic volatile organic compounds. And with trees in particular, there's the potential trade-off of associated with tree falls and, and limb drops. So these, what we found is that these trade-offs are real and that there is, um, it is worth investing management and attention in thinking about how to how to minimize the trade-offs while also um, while also getting gaining the benefits both for, from a nature perspective and also a human health perspective. So we know trees are important, but we also know that trees and nature in general are inequitably distributed. And so we conducted a broad scale nationwide analysis of this question of the inequity in, um, uh, <clears throat> in park access and greenness uh, in, in greenness. Recently, this was published in Nature Sustainability in um, 2022. And what we found is that um, looking across many thousands of cities, we found that there's a persistent association between um, uh, a, a persistent association between race and income and the amount of park access you have in your neighborhood and also the amount of greenness. So we measured greenness using normalized dis difference vegetation index, which is not just focused on trees, but measures sort of the volume of total vegetation um, more generally. So we found that this, um, this is not a new result. Many of you have probably heard this, that um, nature is inequitably distributed in cities. So what we've shown here is that this result is um, persistent and broad and common across the entire US. We also conducted a similar, much smaller scale study focused just on, uh, on San Jose a couple of years ago. And what we found there was that tree can both tree canopy cover and park area were associated with both race and income. So what you can see here is um, as you move across, so on the on the on the x-axis, as you move from low income to high income, you can see um, an increase in the amount of canopy cover and park area associated with neighborhoods with generally higher income. And but you can also see that there is a big differences um, among racial groups. And so most interestingly and potentially um, insight, insightful is that um, if what we found is that if you are white, even if you have low income, you're more likely to live in a neighborhood that ha has higher tree canopy cover. And if you're from a non-white racial group, you're more likely to live in a neighborhood that has less canopy cover, even if you are relatively high income. So we know that trees... Trees are important, they benefit human health, they're also vulnerable and potentially um, at, at risk under climate change, and we know that they're inequitably distributed. So how do all of these patterns come together in our urban forest of Silicon Valley? So what we know from Silicon Valley is that Silicon Valley is, um, has a very, very diverse urban forest. So this, um, these pie charts are taken from uh, Reoking Silicon Valley a report we published a few years ago at SFBI, where we compared the historical species composition of the Silicon Valley landscape before European arrival to the modern um, the modern species composition using street tree inventory data. And what we found was that the historical species composition was dominated by native oak trees of just around twenty species, and that the modern ur urban forest has um, less than less than about 5% native trees and a huge, uh, there's been a really, really dramatic increase in species diversity. So we have about 400 species in, in the modern landscape today. And this, this result was taken um, specifically from Palo Alto. And so thinking about those results in the context of climate change and that, um, and that, uh, finding I was talking about earlier, where what we really expect is that drought stress is likely to really, really hammer trees and make them more, ex more exposed and vulnerable to both mortality and, um, and, and pest outbreaks. We uh, wanted to look at what, well, how vulnerable is the forest, is the modern urban forest of Silicon Valley um, to drought stress. So how drought resistant is our urban forest? 
uh, in looking specifically at Silicon Valley. So looking at the street tree inventory data from the city of Mountain View, um, we're showing here the proportion of trees that fall into different water um, water use class classification. So what we're using here is the water use classification system of landscape species. So Dr. Fujino will talk more about this in his talk. Um, but this is a classification system that's aimed at putting species of trees and other vegetation into categories based on how much water they tend to use. And so comparing those um, exotic and native trees and looking across these water use classification uh, categories, what you can see is that there, there's, in at least in the city of Mountain View, the majority of trees fall into the moderate water use um, category. And moderate, moderate water use means um, that the trees are using um, potentially are, are using between 40 and 60% of what they transpire. And so there's a pretty high use and considering that some trees can consume between 100 and 500 gallons a day for a large mature tree, um, the potential um, and so some of that water will come of course from, from whatever is available in the subsurface or the groundwater. Um, but this is a tree in the category of moderate or high or increases the probability that that tree would need to be watered. And if you don't water it, that that tree may be may become drought stressed over time. Um, so looking and uh, on the left is a, uh, a map just showing where all of those moderate and high water use trees are located and you can kind of just see that they're all over the place. So digging in specifically to what what are these what are these trees? So one interesting thing is that in the high water use category, um, there's a lot of native trees, and those trees, it turns out, are redwoods. So redwoods are high a high water using species, and they're relatively common in uh, in the city of Mountain View. In the moderate water use category, the water that category is um, dominated by mostly exotic species, and the most common species in that category are southern Man magnolia, London plain, and sweet gum. So we've also conducted a similar analysis for a couple of other cities. So looking across those other cities and um, see what we can see in terms of comparison and insight. The city of East Palo Alto has a higher proportion than Mountain View of low um, versus uh, of low water using trees compared to moderate and high. However, they still have um, more than a thousand trees in the moderate and high category. Um, and you can see also that the city of East Palo Alto is smaller and has relatively a small num small, smaller number of trees. Palo in Palo Alto, the patterns are quite similar to the city of Mountain View with quite with a large proportion of trees in the moderate um, water use category. And finally, the city of uh, San Jose has many is a much larger city, has um, several hundred thousand trees and um, has patterns somewhat similar to um, to Mountain View as well, with a really large fraction of trees in the moderate and high water use category. Um, the species composition is quite similar across all these cities, with the um, exception that in San Jose, among the highest, most common moderate water use category using um, uh, trees is calorie pear and Japanese zeclova. And so what about tree condition? So I'm going to um, talk in just a minute about why we think that native trees could be are appropriate for planting in the in the urban landscape but one question that i always get when we talk about native trees is well will they will they do well in the urban landscape so um what we've done here is just to take that uh, street tree database from the city of san jose which has really good documentation in the inventory for tree condition and looking across um these categories from critical to excellent tree condition comparing native and, and non-native trees, what you can see is that really similar proportions of, uh, of native and exotic trees fall into each of these categories with the largest, um, the largest percent of trees in relatively good condition. I'll say here that the caveat here is that this is, um, these data are totally observational and we don't know, it could be that native trees are removed more frequently because they die more frequently. We don't know this from the data set. All this is telling us is that there are similar numbers of trees in good condition in native and non-native, in the not native and exotic category. So um, we know that trees are important for people, but they're also important for biodiversity. And um, 
we've thought for a long time that the cities were places that didn't host a lot of biodiversity, but over time through urban ecology research, we've learned that that's not the case. Cities do actually support a large diversity of native species within them, both wildlife and plants, and that cities are serving really important roles for species that use them in different ways. So some species are stopping, like monarch butterflies, are stopping over in cities during long migrations. Other species are going back and forth along the urban to rural gradient and using, using cities during certain times of the year or during, um, during particular seasons when, when resources are scarce in the surrounding landscape. Other species like peregrine falcons and many pollinating insects are really doing very well within the urban footprint and, uh, and find lots of resources there. And so we know biodiversity is already, is already occurring in cities. And so that begs the question, well, what can we do to support more biodiversity? And this is where native trees become a really important piece of the story because there's quite a bit of evidence that native trees do a better job of supporting biodiversity compared to non-native trees. And so some results from, um, from uh, Santa Clara County, this is um, looking at large patches of native cover in urban parks in Santa Clara County. We used eBird data to look at the com comparison of species richness in, in, in parks across the county. And what we found was that um, parks that had greater percent native within the park had higher richness of, um, of birds. There's also an... Um, some other research published recently by Eric Wood in South, from Los Angeles in Southern California, and this is work published in Ecological Applications on the importance of street uh, street trees. And what they found is that um, street trees uh, contribute disproportionately; they're used disproportionately relative to their abundance. So they're quite uncommon in the urban landscape, but despite that, they're used in greater um, in greater proportion to what you would predict based on their relative abundance in the landscape. And those native trees include species we also have here, including California sycamore and coast live oak. So another thing to consider when thinking about native trees and, and climate change is, uh, will those native trees likely be able to persist into the future? And this is also a question that comes up really regularly in conversations about what, um, what trees to plant for in order to adapt to climate change. So I'm gonna, um, breeze through this relatively quickly. This is from some um, species distribution models produced by the USDA as part of the forecasts private, uh, project. Um, this is forecasts of climate associated shifts in tree species. So I'm pulling just um, some pretty, um, uh, some. I'm pulling the Hadley climate scenario, which is not a conservative scenario for the year 2050 and looking at the potential, the. Um, species range changes compared to the contemporary range. So what you see here is contemporary, the current range um, in the green, uh, sort of the green outline and the red is identifying areas where the current and the future range are predicted to be identical. And so what you're looking for is changes in range. So that's represented by a loss in, uh, um, so white inside the, the green boxes. So these are not awesome maps, so I'll just show this pretty quickly, but the um, the basic take-home message is that canyon live oak, coast live oak, and valley oak are likely to continue to be suitable into the future in um, climate change, under climate change scenarios uh, at, into the year 2050. California black oak and blue oak similar, however, coast redwood is the one species that's likely not to, um, to be very suitable uh, under climate change into the future in Silicon Valley. So in conclusion, climate change is definitely a threat to the urban forest and how to maintain our existing forest is as important as the question of species selection. Much of our urban forest is vulnerable to climate change and there's potential to need irrigation to cope with drought stress. And this is something I think um, Dr. Fugino will talk quite a bit more about in his talk. Um, we also know native trees are a small fraction of urban trees in California and many more could be added without losing diversity of trees. Um, and that, that adding more native trees could be both a good strategy. Um, they're mostly drought tolerant um, and will likely tolerate cl climate change, and this they will also su help support biodiversity. Um, thank you for your time. I look forward to any questions. There's time for them. Thank you so much, uh, Erica. That was wonderful. I want to just share quickly that this webinar is 
um, actually being uh, supported and funded by the Santa Clara County Office of Sustainability. And so, uh, Eric, I appreciate that you uh, had a really nice section in there uh, with data very specific to um, cities within Santa Clara County. So thank you for that. Okay, with that, we're going to have uh, Dave Muffley uh, share his presentation now. Hello, can folks hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let's hope that, okay, so, oh no. Okay, I've run into a little issue. Give me one moment, please. I, I do wanna say, I gotta apologize. I am recovering from the flu and that could impact me. Okay. Okay. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, with that and my apologies, let's get rolling. So this is the Stanford University campus. That is the dish. The tree in the foreground is a blue oak that was dated to roughly 300 years, about 40 years ago. And in the background is the giant telescope dish visible from 280. I begin many of my talks with this slide because this is where I began my journey with oaks and trees was on the dish planting native oaks. And interestingly, it's also where Steve Jobs and I learned about each other, or specifically, he learned about me, because Steve Jobs loved to walk the dish at Stanford. And he watched me and my colleagues from Magic plant oaks there for 30 years. So that was how I ended up being the senior arborist at Apple. So on Stanford University, we've planted upwards of 5,000 trees, mostly native. Beginning 20 years ago, we began small scale investigations with some non-native oaks as we began to see some of the drawbacks with the local natives. So this is, yet again, I wanted to show you a blue oak I've grown. I've collected many blue oak acorns. I have uh, planted many of them. And honestly, I don't really plant them anymore because of, they didn't do very, they, they, they were too slow, perhaps, and also prone to powdery mildew. So another major project of mine is the Canopy 101 sound wall. So I designed the planting nearly a thousand trees in 2006. We installed it in 2007 with hundreds of volunteers, and it is growing to this very day. Some of the trees have been removed to enlarge roadways, um, but by and large, many of the trees are surviving. Here's June 2007, just a few months after we planted the trees, and yes, there are trees planted there even though the weeds are taller. Now let's go forward four years. There's 2011 and suddenly things are beginning to grow. Now let's go nine years beyond that. The sound wall planting is very successful in line with what Erica was talking about. We utilized entirely drought tolerant trees, high percentage native. And it has been an extraordinarily successful project. And I personally have learned a lot. The 101 sound wall planting became the proof of concept for the enormous Apple Park mega campus. I was the senior arborist at Apple for seven years. Here you see the, the giant spaceship, the glass spaceship. We planted 9,000 trees of more than 130 different kinds. At the core of the planting were native oaks, the best adapted native oaks for growing in Santa Clara County. We started with local native, then we expanded out where we would use statewide native, 
and then move into regional migrational zone trees. And then we used limited numbers of drought tolerant, only drought tolerant trees that are more or less exotic. Apple Park has been a fantastic success. I urge you guys, you can't really get inside unless you got connection, but you can travel around the perimeter and we stock the perimeter with thousands of interesting trees. Many of the types at Apple Park cannot be found elsewhere and they are thriving. I spent a lovely Sunday this week looking at the trees and after our rainy winter, oh boy, things are doing really well. Here's a picture from my Sunday jaunt. Um, showing that's the that's the main entrance. Those are our street trees growing. And just it's a very satisfying to see. Now, we wanted to talk about my selections for Apple Park were based in many years of planting, not only the projects I've mentioned here, but also many other projects. I've planted many other trees. So now I wanna take a second and talk about what I talk, call trouble trees. For more than 30 years, the question I've asked myself is what trees really belong in our urban forests, particularly as changing climatic conditions become increasingly extreme. A natural place to start with this question is by looking at what trees are growing here already. How are they doing? To determine local performance of a tree type in question, we need to take a full population condition snapshot for a particular type of tree. We need to look at whole populations, not just a few spectacular specimen trees. Judging a tree type just by the best looking trees is like learning about human beings by looking only at human celebrities. It's just not an accurate representation of reality. For decades, I have watched people base their opinions of specific tree types by looking at only the best types of trees, while utterly overlooking the dying, declining, and otherwise stressed examples of the very same tree types all around them. As a fanatical tree observer with a renowned memory, I don't seem to have any choice but to see all of them, good and bad. Because of these observations, I'm one of a small number of people pushing hard to radically improve and expand our tree selections in California. This talk is really my plea to you to notice the declining stress in dying trees in the urban forest around you. This is a plea to see the whole population of trees, not just the exceptional specimens. When you start looking at all of the trees along the street, you'll see many failures. Yet those very declining water needy tree types are still planted by the tens of thousands every year in the Bay Area, even as they perform poorly in many places. Thus, my plea is to see all the trees. I want to note that my comments here are directed toward trees in the public right-of-way and especially street trees, which are probably the trickiest kind of tree to specify successfully. The public right-of-way can be a real war zone for trees. I have long specialized in full combat or boriculture. I have exacting requirements of all the trees I plant because I hate losing. Trees are harder to establish than most people think. Losing that investment to a poorly selected or a poorly grown tree is an avoidable tragedy. Avoiding obvious failures is the first key step to successful adaptation. I also want to note that right now, in our urban forests, many drought stressed trees are recovering with our strong winter rains. But I wanna remind everybody that this is a temporary recovery that will easily be undone in our next inevitable drought cycle. So what specifically are the trouble trees? I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna start, I'm only gonna name a handful of, of kind of the more spectacular kind of tragic trees we choose. Um, I'll start with more obscure and move to trees that people tend to love and that will make me unpopular. First tree, um, this one planted a lot in South, Southern California, also around here, some Australian willow, Gaijira parviflora. I see a lot of these trees, most of them look like this one, which is they're very thin. They 
trees don't seem to have the drought tolerance that has been promised of them. And in the conditions when they do grow, unfortunately, they are extremely failure prone. These are not good trees, folks. I've been a consulting arborist for a long time, and I've had an opportunity to evaluate these trees. And please, no need for Gaijira. We have a lot of other good choices. Another not recommended tree that's extremely popular is camphor trees, Cinnamomum camphora. Camphor has only a very moderate amount of drought tolerance, but the problem in the public right-of-way is this. They make enormous, enormous root buttresses that destroy pavement. All that light-colored paving you see there was replaced recently. This tree has probably gone through 10 sidewalk replacement cycles at many thousands of dollars each time. Planting trees that are too large for their spaces is an avoidable disaster. Another set of trees that have a higher water use than I consider reasonable are the red maples and the related red maple, silver maple hybrids. And unfortunately, because I got sick, I didn't get very many good pictures. But if you learn to identify red maples when they are young, you're going to see a lot of them struggling. And in really droughty conditions, they do not do well. And especially if you look at red maples in the late summer, what you're going to see is that they're typically drooping terribly. And the reason everybody keeps planting them is no matter how drought stressed they get over the summer, unless they're killed, they still make the same good fall color. So people just don't see the tree when it's stressed. They're only aware of it when it looks spectacular, and this leads to an overinvestment. Next tree, um, again, Dr. Spotswood, um, I'm following on Southern Magnolia. We really need to stop planting Southern Magnolias. There was a claim in the last, um, in, in Erica's slides, that they had moderate drought tolerance. I'm not seeing moderate drought tolerance, I'm seeing low drought tolerance. You can find examples like this all over the place. Here's another one right in my neighborhood. Southern Magnolias really thrived in the Bay Area when we had lawns, but lawns are not appropriate. Lawns began to be pulled out in the droughts of the 70s. Southern Magnolia no longer belongs here. We need to move on, folks. So not recommended, calorie pears. This is one example. There are many. You can see them all over downtown Palo Alto, for instance. A few of them look good. Most of them are stunted. They get terrible fire blight. They're just not performing. And often, especially the Bradford pear cultivar, has terrible structure. The days of calorie pear are over. We need to diversify, head toward native, head toward biodiversity trees. Now, let's talk about sycamores a little bit. Not recommended for sure. Now we go to specific cultivars. Yarwood London Plain, um, I'll show you a picture of. Bloodgood is one that was bred for the Pacific Northwest and it gets terrible powdery mildew here. Blood good, we can plant them up in our mountains, but in the coastal zone, they are nightmare trees. These are Yarwood London Plains in the spring. Yarwood has proved to be a really kind of abysmal tree planted in large numbers. They have less drought tolerance and they have sycamore trees are known for the strength of their branching. Yarwood falls apart. It was a poor selection. So I really want to discourage people from ever planting yarwood again. So also the straight species, Platinus racemosa, you've got real problems here, folks. They get really bad anthracnose in the Bay Area. Observe some. You'll see they also get terrible anthracnose. This photograph was taken Sunday on the Stanford University campus. In the foreground are four Platinus racemosa straight species, um, California sycamores, and they have terrible anthracnose. Um, they are now recovering. We're moving out of the anthracnose time and they will improve somewhat. 
But here you're also seeing a sycamore tree which needs to tap into deep groundwater being grown in a compacted dry location. This is not where to utilize this tree. Now, in the background, you see some actual other sycamores. The line of healthy green trees, those are Columbia London Plains. So as I say here, if you must plant sycamore, I recommend the Roberts cultivar of Platinus race mosa and the Columbia cultivar of the London plane tree. And um, I did not allow California sycamore onto the Apple Park campus for the first several years of the project until I found the Roberts cultivar. This is Roberts taken on Sunday. This is the reception center at Apple Park. These trees have been growing seven feet a year with excellent access to deep soil levels. And they do get some anthracnose, but if you really want a successful California sycamore, make sure it has access to deep soils. And I recommend using the Roberts cultivar. Maybe others will be discovered. And finally, again, as, as Dr. Spotswood mentioned, sequoia sempervirens, we plant far, far, far too many of them. Here's a set that were on the old Apple Park campus. You saw plenty of this over the last several years throughout the Bay Area. And redwoods, they want to be on top of our mountains where they get up to 80 inches of rainfall a year and maybe more. We get 15. So we're emptying our reservoirs to make up a 65 inch irrigation deficit. It, it's just not a good choice. It's not a good strategy going forward for climate change. So let's go to the good news now that I've said all the depressing stuff and we'll go through this pretty quickly. So based partly in the success of Apple Park, we are introducing dozens of new types of oaks and other kinds of trees into the California nursery industry. This is Devil Mountain Nursery, little five gallon trees growing in beautiful air pruning pots. So we're also having a root revolution, which is gonna make all these trees work better. So this is a liner size Pioneer air pruning container. They sit into the racks 32 at a time. The racks are there to keep the trees from drying too quickly. This is what happens when you put an oak into a Pioneer liner. Those are the tap roots. They will prune naturally because of the air, and then they will re-sprout. And the pruning of the tap roots stimulates side branching. And this turns an oak into a much better nursery tree. So here's the kind of root system that we create, very fibrous, no circling, excellent quality. This is a five gallon Pioneer pot. You can see the roots coming out. And this is the kind of root system that we make with this. This is transformational in the industry. So now quickly, let me run you through five of my new favorites. Um, let me do want to mention something. So I've planted valley oaks. I've planted native oaks in the cities and there's some problems. That's a valley oak planted from seed 1991, 30 years old. That's the sidewalk. The sidewalk has been cut and flattened four times already. If you're going to plant a valley oak, make sure it's a big spot. I like eight feet. And with Coast Live Oak, you'd want six feet, but there's some other issues. So let's have a look at some other native oaks that are proving to grow quite well. So here is an Engelman Oak, Quercus Engelmanii, Southern California, San Diego, inland up to Pasadena. This is Apple Park taken on Sunday. They're beautiful. They grow much faster than the native blue oak. They do not have the same powdery mildew susceptibility, and they are proving to be excellent street trees. Here's an idea of what a medium-sized specimen that would be in the Bay Area at about year 50. Here's the foliage. Here's a mature tree in uh, Santa Isabel, Southern California. And they have proven to be good urban trees. This is Arcadia, very survivable. 
an upright evergreen native oak, island oak. Quercus tomentella grows on the islands. We grew them for Apple Park and they grew beautifully and now they are regularly available in our nursery industry. An upright evergreen urban friendly native oak that doesn't produce a ton of acorns so you don't have the, all the acorn issues. So this is one in Santa Barbara. They're lovely, upright, glossy leaf. This is uh, high school on the Central Coast. Again, they grow beautifully. This is the very unusual leaf. And here we have some young street trees in Santa Barbara. So I'm gonna go over just a tiny bit. So if you've got a really large area, I encourage you to plant Torrey Pines. This is the Stanford Arboretum. These are 140-year-old Torrey Pines. If you have the space, it's one of the most successful trees I've ever planted. This is in Berkeley near the Bay. These are trees in Cupertino. And this is Torrey Pine in the Stanford Arboretum with an understory of coast live oak. Torrey pine can grow over native oak woodland, and it may provide them a little buffering from climate change. We utilize this strategy extensively at Apple Park. Now, a medium-sized evergreen oak. This is from the American Southwest into Mexico. The silver leaf oak, beautiful, upright. When they're young, they look kind of like olives. Lovely. The acorns are tiny. The leaf underside is white. These are some smaller trees in habitat. And this is one at Hoyt Arboretum up in Portland that's been growing there for almost 30 years. It's a beautiful, beautiful tree. Now, a last one, just in case I haven't offended there's anybody I've missed. The small tree category in drought tolerance is virtually impossible to fill. We have very few selections. We are very excited, at least I am and several others of us, about a small eucalyptus. This is a tree that was grown at Stanford. I bicycled under that tree for 20 years, and it really is a nice tree. So here's the flowers. And with that, I will turn over. I am available for consulting, and there is my information. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Dave. Appreciated all of your photo examples. It's very helpful in your many years of um, firsthand experience. Thank you so much. All right, now we're going to um, have Dr. Dave Fugino um, share with us some information about trees and water. So let's let you take it away. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, thank you. Okay, and can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so. Okay, just let me switch this. Okay, so I'm assuming everyone can see the full screen. Yep, yep perfect. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dave Fugino, and as Natalie has said, I'm the executive director for the California Center for Urban and Horticulture. And it's my pleasure to um, present today um, to you folks uh, with regards to the wukals, depending on how you call it, it's wukals or wukals, searchable plant uh, online database. So before I really get into it, I wanted to give you just a very brief background on the history of the wukals, uh, of the wukals uh, um, project. And so it originally began in 1991. It was funded by the Department of Water Resources, DWR, and the Bureau of Reclamation. And uh, work was um, initially and actually pioneered and led by Cooperative Extension uh, uh, Farm Advisor Larry Costello and Catherine Jones. The first edition was completed in 1992, as you can see, and then the subsequent second and the third edition in 94 and 99. And then it went through, a, how would I say it, a, a lull or a period where there was no activity with regards to the update of the database. Um, just as an FYI, I did not get involved with, with Wukals or Wuckles uh, until 2013 and 2014, which at, at that point in time, um, I was able to uh, garner some money from the Department of Water Resources and from industry 
and to actually conduct the fourth edition or the review and update. So if you were to go online uh, on the um, CCUH website and the and the WUCALS um, website itself or the homepage, you'll see the, the WUCALS 4 2014 update uh, on the right hand side that you see here. You'll see the uh, the menu in orange. Um, I'll be, uh, how would I say, demoing this um, some slides later in the presentation. So this is what it currently looks like. Uh, a couple of key points that I wanted to point out, um, you know, to, to all of you with regards to WUCALS is that WUCALS was a guide um, for plant water needs or plant water requirements and is not, so I want to make sure you understand, it's not a method for estimating landscape water uh, needs. We'll talk about that as an example um, later on. Two is that with regards to WUCALS, um, a qualitative research approach was used, and it was used in conjunction with um, bringing together horticultural professionals representing six different climatic regions in the state. So as the state, as the committee um, met and they ranged anywhere from, let's say, six to 12 um, professionals in each committee, uh, they went plant by plant. And if they did not have any wisdom or experience with that plant, then the plant was not evaluated. Um, and then when the, the review and update was completed in 2014, about 1,700 additional taxa were added, and it brought up to just north of 3,500. And it should be noted and pointed out with regards to actual field research uh, with, with statistics, um, there's less than 5% of that database or the plants that are listed have been conducted with actual field research. The good news is, um, you know, is that, uh, and uh, I believe most of you folks will be the first to know since this was just approved last week. So uh, last week, the Department of Water Resources has um, funded or will be funding a contract and the fifth edition will begin um, on July 3rd. Uh, that will start with, um, I would say, a review and update and with the target of adding another 1700 taxa to the existing database. So before we get into um, uh, talking about WUCLs in terms of when you use it and how to use it, um, I wanted to digress a little bit and, and just um, get us all centered around what strategy should we, should we employ for irrigating plants. And so I, I, I know that most of you, if not all of you know this, but I just wanna go over uh, this briefly with you uh, because it'll be important as we move forward in the presentation. So here at the university, um, we, we, teach, we teach and educate you know, our students that irrigation should be based on plant response to environmental demand. And as um, and I think Eric had alluded to earlier, environmental demand is evapotranspiration. And evapotranspiration is measured in inches and it's specific for different regions of California. And so if you wanted to find evapotranspiration information, uh, you would simply go to the DWR website and you would go to the website, California Irrigation Management Information System, which is referred to as CIMIS. So you go to that CIMIS website. And again, just remember that evapotranspiration is in inches, units. Uh, with regards to irrigation frequency and amount of water to be applied, it's not only defined by environmental demand, but you also have to consider soil water holding capacity, uh, root depth, and slope. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, the other is, is that irrigation should be applied so that the soil water reservoir is filled and gravity and drainage um, do not occur or it ceases. And at that point, we define that as field capacity. And thus, um, so ultimately what we're gonna do is a replacement strategy or a replenishment strategy. So as that water is lost through evapotranspiration, so water lost from the soil and through transpiration from the plant material, it will trigger an irrigation event. And that's um, typically around 40 to 50% of the acronym called MAD or the Management Allowable Depletion. 
So to demonstrate that, uh, I have this little diagram here, and I'll just quickly go through it. This is that if you look at the, the, um, the blue color here, that would represent when the soil, prof soil profile is filled at field capacity and drainage and runoff has ceased, okay? And, uh, and then this entire blue area here, if, if you were to think that it was in inches of water, would be at field capacity. At the point that the sun comes up and evapotranspiration occurs, basically you can see that water is depleted from the top half of the soil. At that point where it reaches somewhere around 40 to 50 percent, which is of, of the maximum allowed depletion, an irrigation event is then triggered and then the water is replaced or replenished. So that's the strategy or theory around um, the replacement and replenishment. And, and that is, uh, how would I say it, in the common trade, both for professionals and for homeowners, is really not, not the strategy that actually is employed. So then let's just jump into uh, to WUCO. So when do, when do you use it or when do I use it? So um, most of you, if not all of you, know that WUCO is tied to the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. So, for example, if you were trying to seek a building permit, you would go into your local planning department and you would be required to fill out and submit a landscape documentation package. So that would be the first thing you would have to do. Um, this, is an, this is a requirement for new construction, and this is also required for rehabilitated landscapes. Both of them have a threshold, uh, a landscape area threshold, and as you can see for new construction, that's 500 feet. And you can see for um, rehabilitation, rehabil rehabilitated landscapes, that's 2,500 feet. Oops. So you can choose either what's called the performance approach or the prescriptive approach. Um, for today's uh, presentation, I'm gonna be focused on the performance approach. I'll get into that more in detail, but that's a water budget calculation that um, you would have to submit as part of your landscape uh, documentation package. And then the other important point is to know is when you're using the performance approach or the um, equation, you must uh, um, derive or obtain your plant factors for water requirements from WUCLs. So that's part of the statute of MWILO. Okay, so this gets a little bit hairy because this is math and this is equation, but I'll, I'll try to go through this very quickly and get everybody um, centered around uh, the performance approach. Um, again, there are two equations. One is MAWA or the maximum applied water allowance, and you can see the equation here. The second equation is ETWU or the estimated total water use, and you can see that here. And in order to be in compliance with MWILO, the statute, at Wu, your estimated water use has to be less than MAWA. And so if you kind of focus in on this top left-hand MAWA calculation, you'll see that, remember what we talked about before, ETO or reference transpiration is required in this equation. It's also required in the at Wu calculation. Okay, so you'll see that. And in, in addition, you'll see this PF or the plant factor in the at Wu. So that plant factor is gonna come from WUCOLs. The other, like I said, is, is that the um, reference transpiration comes from CIMIS. So I just printed this out quickly to show you that for San Jose, you can see the different um, evapotranspiration or ETO values for each month. And the, and the thing to notice about it is, is, is that the evapotranspiration varies every month. So my question would be, if ETO varies every month, then how many times should you reprogram your conventional irrigation controller per year for both homeowners and for irrigation professionals if they have a conventional controller? And the answer is 12 times for every month. And so probably all of us would say, we don't do that. So it, it, it is really merely to demonstrate how challenging landscape uh, water conservation and, and water efficiency is in irrigation management. So in terms of utilizing WUCLs or WUCLs, um, we want to follow the MWILO requirements. 
And simply put, this, these are not all the requirements that are listed in MOELA, so I just kind of highlighted a few. <clears throat> but most importantly, if following MOELA, what you want to do is, is to group plants or plant plants together with the same water needs. So as you can see is that if in this just depiction here is that you would plant low water, you would group low water use plants together, moderate and then high. And then um, by by the requirement within them, we low trees need to be in their own hydro zone and they need to be have their own separate irrigation valve. So all these different <clears throat> water needs would be in their own hydro zone and they would be irrigated by their own. Um, or an irrigation valve. That's the important take home uh, take home message. So so how do I use <clears throat> wood goals? So you can see that the kind of steps that I outline here. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just going to actually demonstrate them quickly for you. So if I were to go ahead and open up the browser, I'm just going to simply type in wood calls. Click on the first thing that comes up. Here's this orange mem memo, I'm an orange menu that I had mentioned in the previous slides or at the beginning. I'm just simply going to scroll down the plant search database. I come to the database. I'm going to type in San Jose. I now will have a choice of water use. So I'm going to create a low water use uh, plant list. So I'll have all of those plants. And as you can see, it instantly populates with 1,000 or 1,029 plants. So that's the total number of plants for these all these plant types. So if I was specifically interested in just trees, I would just toggle on the tree, and you'll actually see that there's 219 plant uh, selections here. If I want to create and download an Excel file, I simply would highlight all of these to my favorites. So you'll see up here it says 219. Scroll down to the Excel spreadsheet. Go ahead and create the download here. Open it up. And if I can use this um, quickly, I'll just go to column width and expand it. And then this is your list for 219 plants. The important point that I wanted to highlight in um, San Jose is in region one out of the six regions. You can see where the ETO is, is that it's 10 to 30%. Uh, that would be the plant factor on the right hand side of, that would um, equate to 0.1 to 0.3. And that's the number that gets used in the MAWA and, um, uh, and the EPWU uh, calculations. So let me close out of there. Let me go back to here. So here's that, uh, how would I say it? Um, here's the equation again for MAWA and ETWU. You can see that the plant factor here is right here. This is, uh, let's say that we got the 0.3 uh, and that's where it go in the equation. And then, um, and then I'm, what I wanted to do is just kind of really move forward and, and just quickly review to how do we confirm low water use landscapes? So we're gonna use this as an example, save water. And so taking a quote from Lord Calvin, you have to measure it, okay? And the important po point to know is, is that this is um, a flow meter or a, a, a device that measures the amount of water. And so um, we actually employ these at, at UC Davis. And so the bottom line is efficient irrigation systems can save water. So if they're designed, installed, managed, and maintained that way, you can save landscape water. And the real take home, another take home message that I want to leave with remember plants do not save water. So remember that plants do not save water. It's the person managing the irrigation controller that saves that water. Okay, so let's go to example of, um, of trees. So we have some trees here at UC Davis in our smart landscape initiative. Uh, and you can see them here. This is just a, um, a rendition that the students put together. There's three hydro zones, mixed landscape one, two, and three. The trees are in hydro zone three. They're planted here with a um, deep root watering system. And then basically what I wanted to show is we're using the calculation for MAWA network. You can see that MAWA 
or is is greater than or et wu is less than ma wa. So that basically would satisfy the em wheel requirement. Remember in this particular case is that et wu is an estimate, okay? And it's an estimate based off that plant factor that's in that comes from wu calls. But you sh I showed you in the previous slide, how do we know we actually save water? Well, the way that we actually save water, remember, is with the flow meter. So we installed this flow meter and here's the results. Um, this is the second year for our trees. You can see from the Mawa calculation up on the top, you can see that Mawa is on the top. Etwu is basically the 2690, but the actual water that we apply is the 3340. So it's still less than the Mawa calculation and it still would be in compliance. So that's how we know that we're in compliance and we actually know how many gallons of water that we're applying per year. Okay, shifting gears um, very quickly is um, Natalie uh, uh, had asked me to touch on irrigation best management practices. So I'm gonna shift in the, uh, in the next couple of minutes really quickly. This actually takes a whole day or two days to teach these uh, different concepts, but I'm gonna touch upon them, allow you to look through them. Uh, and then if you have questions, um, ask me at the end of the, at the presentation or feel free to contact me offline. But I won't go through all of these, but we um, we suggest to all of our irrigation professionals to perform a quick irrigation uh, um, audit. So these are some of the, the what we would call the low hanging fruit that you can do before you start or, you know, into um, your irrigation uh, irrigation season. Remember, this is that I asked you before is, is that you can see that evapotranspiration uh, values uh, for San Jose, and they vary per month. Remember, the answer was that you would um, you would reprogram your controller 12 times a year. But leveraging um, current technology, you can go to um, a irrigation controller called a smart controller. And a smart controller will actually um, pull weather information or evapotranspiration data for you and actually make that calculation so you don't have to program it in 12 times. And it will provide that um, and make that adjustment on a daily, uh, weekly, monthly, and, and uh, basis for the entire year. So currently I've listed out a few highlights or key points of smart controllers as it pertains to MWILO. Um, the important thing to understand and know is all smart controllers are not the same. I won't go into the detail why. Um, you can see that there are two different types of um, uh, controllers, smart controllers. There's weather-based and soil moisture sensor-based controllers, and they typically require a trained professional. And the reason for that is, is that there are other um, components or other factors that need to be programmed into the computer, which we had mentioned before, um, such as soil, plant type, application rate, slope, and et cetera. But at the end of the day, even though they're smart, they're only as smart as the person that actually installs and programs it. And after the, they are installed, you should make sure that you um, look at your plant material as a really good horticulturist would. The last thing you know, I wanted to wrap up and just share with you is, is that if you don't have a smart controller, how would you manage irrigation? And, and we have a training where we done a workshop with single trees. We go into multiple trees and we go into what's called, um, how would I say, mixed landscapes with trees. This is just an example with a single tree. We don't have the time to go through all of this, but what I wanted to leave you with is a resource. So if you quickly look, kind of scan through steps one through five, and then steps um, six, uh, six through nine here, this will be in the, how would I say, in the presentation handout. The important point of focusing in on this example is, is that I want you to take particular note of calculating app application rate in inches per hour, because you're gonna need that in order to program your controller. And then the other is, is that um, this example will allow you to calculate a runtime for a single tree in the San Jose area for that climate region. And uh, it assumes that you're going to irrigate three times a week. If you were to click on the example handout, I'm not going to go through this, but I'm just going to um, just kind of go through. This is my colleague, Jim Borneman, and I. We conduct these um, irrigation management workshops throughout the state of California. 
He's graciously put this together for you. So if you start looking through steps one through eight, I know that I, hopefully uh, Dave Muffley is not going to see this as Southern Magnolia because I know he's not recommending this tree. So a uh, bad choice on my part. Um, but you can actually go through these steps and it will actually determine the amount of runtime and the schedule for a single tree using drip irrigation with a conventional controller. So um, this will be available for you uh, in the handouts. So in closing and wrap up, you know, I, I, I wanted to um, provide you with some key learnings for today and you can look through one through nine, but the most um, important centered around the presentation for Wukols is, is one, two, and three, which is Wukols is a guide, as you stated before, for plant water needs. It's required by Amwilo and it will provide you a list based on water needs for a specific um, regional climate within the state of California. The other um, bullets four through nine, I covered um, how to say it earlier in the presentation, but I didn't choose to highlight those. So I wanna thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran over a couple of minutes here, um, but I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, Wukos is an incredible tool and we're grateful that you took the time to explain it in, in more depth for us. So thank you so much. Um, we're gonna move into our question and answer section now. Um, we've had many wonderful questions come through. So uh, we'll, we will get through as many as we can. Um, and then we will uh, have our speakers try to answer some in writing that we can post on our website uh, later on. So with that, um, we will begin. So um, the first question I'm gonna pose is, um, along with climate resilient trees, what do you all recommend for understory plants? So can I jump in and take that? Yes, please. Okay. And I think I, I just answered a bunch of these in writing. So we utilized understory trees a lot, both at Apple Park and on the 101 sound wall. The trees that I, the, the tree slash shrubs that we've had the most success with, um, a favorite of mine, we used a lot of Prunus lianii. Um, the native Alyssa folia can also work, but it's just really slow growing. And my actual favorite is there's a hybrid between Prunus alyssifoli and Prunus lyonii, which is this lovely moderately sized Prunus. So that's one of my faves. Um, going to the Mediterranean, we've used a lot of our Butus unedo strawberry tree, but specifically the compacta variety which grows much more consistently tighter and more compactly than the straight species. Another one I like to use is Frangula californica, the leather leaf variety of the, the California coffee berry. We've used those in understory situations. And um, if you have big trees and need an understory, I like Toyon, but um, Toyon in the Bay Area has some issues. We see a lot of disease loading. At Apple Park, we utilized a variety called Davis Gold, which has yellow berries. And they have proven absolutely bulletproof and they grow almost into small trees. So there's a couple. Thanks, Dave. Erica, do you have any thoughts on understory plants? Understory plants or understory trees? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, yeah. well, yeah. So um, I like what I try and recommend is thinking about um, habitats. So, what we, what happens in urban landscapes, of course, is you have all these different ways that urban landscapes are fragmented. So, there's, impervious cover, there's buildings, all of that sort of hacks up the landscape and makes it harder for species to move across. And so um, another thing that happens is habitats, which are, are sort of ecosystem types, which are really like coherent groups of species of plants that live together in similar abiotic conditions. 
um, those get fragmented as, as well. So if you move, you know, down a street on a residential neighborhood, you're just, you're, you're getting, you could get, you know, 150, 200 different types of understory plants. And in an oak woodland, for example, you wouldn't have that. You would have, you know, a, a, a smaller number of more predictable species growing together. So I sort of like the idea of trying to recreate habitats and predictable assemblages of species that grow together. So um, for an oak woodland, that if you wanted to try and mimic an oak woodland in an urban landscape, um, uh, species like um, locally native Arctostaphylus, so man manzanitas, um, ceanothus, um, there's many species of those available at local nurseries. Um, uh, Arbonesia californica, so California sagebrush, those are all pretty good options. They do really well in urban landscapes. They have pretty flowers and um, people like them. Okay, thank you. Um, I Another question is, um, what are ways that urban tree canopy can be integrated into green uh, storm stormwater infrastructure? Thoughts on that? Anybody else? Dr. Dr. Fujino or Dave, you want to take this if you have experience? Um. It's a. I don't have a clean answer to this because it's it's a little too general. I'm a little bit more of a mechanic or an engineer, so you've kind of got to tell me what what kind of system you're using. Um, but yeah, so sorry, I skipped that one in the written answers too. <laughs> Yeah, I think it well, it depends, right? It depends a lot on how the thing is structured. Like, does it have an underdrain? Does it, is it, if you're some, there is experimentation with some bioretention basins that are um, using native soil and then connected to not, they don't have a, a liner on the bottom. So, depending on what type of system you have, you may be, you may be able to use trees or not. But if it's like a lined thing with the, um, gravelly soil, it, those systems um, are often not awesome for trees because they're sort of designed in a way where they, they take as much water as possible and then they dry out. So you need species that live in them that can tolerate both inundation and extreme dryness between your rain events. And that's a little bit hard on trees. So it really depends on the, uh, the type, type of system. There's definitely experimentation in this, in this arena though. So um, definitely worth paying attention to what are the what are the things that seem to be working best? Um, what are the types of um, engineering for bioretention basins that make them most able to to have trees in them? So let me follow on. I really like that answer. I really like unlined. The if you unline them, suddenly you can grow things around them. But if they're lined, you can't. And many times our soils will accept much more water than we're attempting to put into them. And we're sending all this excess water to the bay when we could sink it right into our landscapes and support trees. We did that a lot. We did a bunch of unlined ones at Apple Park and our biggest trees are around the biggest unlined swale areas. So, yep, I think that's great. Um, this one might be a big question. <laughs> so, um, how about introducing trees adapted to semi-arid climate conditions? Dave, I know you answered this briefly in the, in the Q and A. Um, and yeah, just curious to hear your thoughts on that for both of you and Dave. So why don't I start out? One of the things that I want most is good biodiversity information about a wide range of those semi-arid trees. We've got biodiversity information about natives, but I'm curious for more about the, because I've planted a lot of those semi-arid trees. That's a lot of what I do. I went into the American Southwest. I go onto the island, onto the Skylands, the mountains to collect acorns. 
which are now in our nursery industry, and they're all arid adapted. They're mostly related to our native species. And we've been utilizing that strategy since the beginning of California. The California peppers that are planted, the olives, the cork oaks, the holly oaks, those are all examples. And over time, I've moved away from the more Mediterranean um, drought tolerant trees and moved more toward the Southwestern and Mexican and Baja types because they are connected. They're evolutionarily connected to the California native um, flora and I think are more likely to serve as potential biodiversity plants in a time when one study after another shows that organisms that can move are moving on the planet with climate change. So to some extent, I favor utilizing the urban planting zone where it's hard to plant things for potential migration species. So the, the semi-arid trees is a strategy that I utilize enormously. So I can follow up on that. Um, I think, yeah, from a, from a biodiversity perspective, most of the studies in this arena have found that native trees provide more habitat value and greater biodiversity support compared to non-native trees. I think there's not a lot that I know of that compares different categories of, of non-native, but I think you can reasonably assume that closer allied species and near native. So those would be species that are of the same genus of a tree that is native or species that are have their range close by, but not necessarily right here. So Engelman Oak is a good example of that. Engelman Oak is really not far. There are records of it um, sort of just south of us. Um, and even species that are down into Arizona and Texas, those are, that's a lot closer than Australia and and the Mediterranean or Europe or China, obviously, those those species you could predict from a biodiversity perspective, they're more those coevolutionary relationships are likely to be closer to wildlife than um, than something from Australia that's evolved for millions of years with a totally different set of flora and fauna, um, completely not adapted at all to our local conditions and has no deep roots with our local wildlife. Uh, so I think you can expect that if you're going to pick a non-native, pick a near-native, <laughs> either same genus and preferably similar like, range that's close by. And um, I do like the idea of considering assisted translocation. So both wildlife and trees are going to need to help to need help moving in order to cope with climate change. And we can think about this in terms of trees of um, moving some of our Southern California species here. Um, but if we're going to do that, ideally, we think a little bit about what's the predicted range. So is the future predicted range for Engelman Oak going to arrive here in 50 or 100 years, for example? Um, that said, I'm not advocating planting 100% native trees. I know that's not realistic. I'm just suggesting we could add a lot of native trees to what we're planting and still have a very diverse urban forest with lots of exotic species in it. Um, yeah, so I think I weaved around and maybe lost a thread there, but <laughs> that's more or less. Oh yeah, there was one more thing to say, which is just, I think in this conversation around species selection, I see a lot of sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater going on of saying, oh, well, like we need to adapt to climate change. So let's just bring things in from Australia. Let's just give up completely on our local trees. And I'm just advocating not to do that, to do sort of both things in combination with each other, um, that our local trees will need help too. Our existing forest needs help. Um, and native biodiversity really needs to be both protected in place and help helped move. So you can't just do assisted translocation and abandon what's in place. You also have to help native trees in where they are now adapt to climate change because some species will adapt, some species will, the predictions for climate change is some species will move, some will adapt locally and be able to tolerate local conditions uh, where they are now. 
and then other species will go extinct. And so that that middle category of protecting things in place is as important as thinking about translocation and moving things north or up into the hills. Thank you so much, uh, Erica. Uh, Dave, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else onto that. Um, no, that was that was a really nice answer. No. Yeah, and actually, I, I kind of would like to sort of end on that answer. <laughs> Um, because we have a lot of very, very specific questions, uh, many that are very specific questions about different species. Uh, and so I think those will be better to answer um, after, after the webinar is over in writing. And we'll, like I said, we'll post this on our website in the next day or so, so you can see the answers to your questions. Um, and yeah, there are many, many more questions too, all great. So thank you all so much for those of you watching for, um, for offering those questions and being engaged. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share one last slide here. <clears throat> um, so let's see. And just want to wrap up and say that, um, yeah, as I said, we will providing all sorts of resources after the webinar. Uh, you should receive an email from us, but they will also be on our website. And um, so you'll get the presentation slides, a recording of this uh, webinar, and then uh, the answers to some of these questions. And if you enjoyed this webinar, we will be, um, there's a, there's, you can use this link here on the slide. Um, it'll also be available in our resources for all of our other webinars that are part of our More Trees Please webinar series that we've been doing for the last few years. Uh, so go check them out. Um, and when you exit the webinar, you will be prompted to fill out a survey. And we would really appreciate your feedback. As I said at the beginning, uh, ISA certified arborists will have uh, their information submitted to West Coast ISA um, for CEUs once you've completed the survey. And, and with that, I wanna thank everybody so much for joining us today. And I hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. So take care everyone.